everybody. Good morning. I've never given a keynote before, and I didn't really want to make this too technical. I want to get everybody pumped and excited for today. So we're going to do a training session on stage, okay? So if you've never been in one of my training uh, classes, you're about to experience a little of it. Now, what do we got? Oh, we got screens here. You guys don't have me my screen up yet here, right? Let's switch over to that right there. Now, I'm going to start. What I want to do this morning is start to get your mind into what I think is core philosophies around go. These are things that I want you to start incorporating into your daily lives as you become um, go developers. And where am I? Where's my slide deck, guys? What happened? All right. I just love this quote. I love this quote for Al, from Alan Kay. Look, let's just read. I'm going to give you a lot of quotes today. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Look, if most computer people lack understanding and knowledge, then what they will select will also be lacking. Think about this. I want every developer to put this on the wall next to their desk. Every time you do an architecture and design, I want you to say to yourself, maybe I don't know everything. I need to solve this particular problem. Maybe I should spend a half an hour asking a colleague or researching or going on go for Slack and just saying, how would you do this? This is really important. It's easy to get stuck in where, what we know. And this is when I start going crazy when somebody says, Bill, what pattern am I supposed to be using for this? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Get your head out of the patterns book. Let's solve the engineering problem we have in front of us. Now, let's go here. I want to prepare your mind for the day, and I want to prepare your mind for when you leave. And there are some really interesting things that I have found over the 20 years that I've been writing software. And this is the first one. Somehow, we all became really impressed with software projects that contain large amounts of code. You start thinking of, like, the Linux operating system. Does anybody have any clue how many lines of code is currently in the Linux operating system? It's like 19 million. 19 million lines of code. You guys want to work on that project? I don't want to work on that project. I'm going to, I'm going to teach you that. I can't even handle 10,000 lines of code. You're going to throw 19 million at us? No way. We need, we honestly need to stop being impressed with the software and how large it is in terms of lines of code. That's really not helping us at all. I want us to start focusing on how do we solve these problems with the least amount of code and get very excited about that. Here's another one. We've been taught since university to create these large layers of abstraction in our code base to deal with change. This is something else that Go is trying to get rid of. Again, less is more, less is more. And, and if we were in a full training session, I'd be able to teach you how do we write thin layers of precise decoupling that give us the same feature functionality that these large layers of abstraction have been promised us. Now, maybe this is one of the most important things that I like to teach. We forgot that the hardware is the platform. When people say to me, performance is important, well, guess where it comes from? It comes from the hardware. I don't care how many layers of operating systems, VMs, whatever you're doing. At the end of the day, some instruction you write has to execute on a core on some piece of hardware. And if you're not mechanically sympathetic with the systems that you're building for, you can just kiss performance goodbye. Go has all of this built in. You get so much mechanical sympathy for, for free from Go. It's not magic that you're seeing the performance you're seeing. Go is always guiding you to the best extent that it can towards mechanical sympathy. But maybe this is the biggest one. This is the biggest one that I see day in and day out. We forgot somehow as engineers that every decision comes with a cost. There is nothing that's free. And in a code review, if I hear people saying, no, that's bad, no, that's good, I want to put the brakes on it. It's not about bad or good. It's about what cost are you willing to take for that decision that you're about to make. And if you don't know the cost you're taking, you are not engineering. You are hacking. I want you to reflect on this talk for the next 40 minutes. Are you doing these things? Are you engineering or are you just hacking your way through life? I want us all to be engineers. I want us all to understand the costs and the decisions we're making that makes us not only better engineers, it makes us better colleagues. It makes our products better. And this is what's really, really important. Look, here's, here's the reality of life today. Technology is changing quickly. 
but our minds change slowly. They just do. And so Go is coming in and trying to change. In some cases, you might feel 20 years of software development practice and, and philosophy. And in some areas, maybe it is. And we're all trying to resist it because we've been productive in our other languages. I need you to start trying to open up your mind. It's easy to adopt new technology, but it's hard to adopt new ways of thinking. And I'm going to try over the next 40 minutes to convince you of some of the things that I want you to start thinking about, some new ways of thinking about how to be an engineer, especially when coding in this language. Now, if you catch me at a bar and I've been drinking whiskey, and you tell me you're a software developer, I'm going to have a ton of fun with you. <laughs> Woo! Depending on if I'm three whiskeys in, it's really going to be good. Because this is one of the first questions I'm going to ask you. Do you care about the legacy you're leaving behind? Think about this for a second. I love this quote. I love this quote. There are two types of software projects. Those that fail and those that turn into legacy horrors. Oh, think about that, right? We're all writing code to get into production. If it doesn't get into production, it's failed. Once it's in production, is it maintainable? Are you maintaining? Are you at the point where you're like, oh, whoa, 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 don't make that change. I don't know what's going to happen. That might break. And you're laughing a little bit, right? But I'm going to tell you two things. One, we've got 40 plus years of software out there today that is legacy. Every time I hear of a bank wanting to upgrade some banking software, you know what I do? I print out five years of statements. Because I'm going to wake up in the morning and I ain't going to have a bank account. And that's all I got is paper. We laugh, but this is really what's happening today. A lot of the banking um, companies today are trying to get off this legacy software. All right? And so I don't want you writing legacy software out of the box. I've got clients today. I'm like, client, you know you're writing legacy software out of the box. Yeah, Bill, I know, but don't worry. We're going to fix that. No, you're not, because you put a, head, a hard deadline now, and you already got another hard deadline coming up. You're never going to fix that. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. You're writing legacy code out of the box. You're writing code today with just the idea of getting it into production and we'll worry about it later, then your software has already failed. Look, legacy software is an unappreciated but serious problem and it might be the downfall of our civilization. I want Hollywood, maybe Bollywood. You know what the next movie's gonna be? It's not asteroids and it's not earthquakes. It's gonna be legacy software failing all over the world and we're all gonna be lost. That's the next movie and if it comes out, I want the rights. Okay, because now it's on video. You got to document it. But I think this is one of the most profound quotes as it relates to legacy software. And it was said by Sarah May. We think awful code is written by awful devs. But in reality, it's written by reasonable devs in awful circumstances. How true is that? It, this one gives me chills. Anytime you've looked at a piece of code and you've said, oh my God, what was this guy smoking? We've all been there. I want you to hold back and go, oh my God, what situation was that developer in that they had to do this? Let's just go, oh my God, all right? And now we try to make it better. I want you to think about all of these things. While, we're, while I'm showing you these quotes and we're talking about that, I want you to self-reflect on who you are as an engineer. Does this resonate with you? Is this important to you? I hope so. I hope you don't want to be writing legacy software out of the box. And with Go, we don't have to. Now, mental models are the way, are one of the clearest ways that we can make sure we're not writing legacy code out of the box. Now, Tom Love, who's the inventor of Objective-C, he's a brilliant guy and he loves numbers. All right? And this is what he said. Imagine a project is going to end up with a million, a million lines of code or more. The probability of that project being successful in the United States is very low, well under 50%. You get to a million lines of code, at least in the United States, and, and, and Tom works on Department of Defense projects, large, large code bases. Why is Tom saying this? He's saying this because he did a study and he identified that a ream, imagine a ream of copy paper. You've all, you've all seen a ream of copy paper before. Tom says that that ream of copy paper contains 10,000 lines of code. 10,000 lines of code. And what Tom says, and I believe it's true, that the average developer cannot maintain more than a ream of paper in their head. Cannot maintain more than 10,000 lines of code. And when I say maintain, it's not memorizing that code. It's understanding what that code is doing. Understanding where everything is. If I ask you, where's this and where's that? You can find it like this. How does that workflow work? That's a mental model. 
And Tom says the average developer can't get beyond 10,000. Now, if that's true, if that's true, think about it. Lines of code become critical if we want to be successful and not have legacy code. That means for every 10,000 lines of code in the project that you're working on right now, you need a software developer to be successful. When you get to a million lines of code, you need 100 software developers. Look, I work on small teams of three to four people. I don't know about you, but how impossible is it to get three or four people steering the boat in the same direction each and every day? It's nearly impossible. And you want to do that with 100 people? And you wonder why? You wonder why these projects fail? It's not a, almost even a technical issue anymore. It's just people. And so we've got to learn. How do we reduce the amount of code? I was on a project uh, last year where there was 100,000 lines of C code for a project. And the project had bugs. It was failing. And this is a testament to Go. It is not a testament to me. Within seven weeks, we rewrote the entire service in Go with about 8,000 lines of code, including dependencies. The whole thing in seven weeks. Which project do you want to maintain? Because at 8,000 lines of code, guess what? We can do it with one dev. We can do it with one dev. Lines of code is really critical to identify team size and success. And what you need to do is get better at trying to do less with more. And it's cognitive load that's really, really kicking, killing us. Look, the hardest bugs are those where your mental model of the situation is just wrong. So you can't see the problem at all. Because everybody knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing the program in the first place. So if you're clever writing it, how the heck are you going to debug it? Seriously. This is real stuff. And, and at the end of the day, it's not coming from me. It's coming from people like Brian Kernahan, Alan Kay, people who have been in the field for the last 40 years years. This is real. They've learned these lessons. Go is trying to bring this to us. Go has given us a minimal language so we can do things in a minimal way and write less code and maintain these mental models. But I will tell you this, you're going to find this crazy. Even when I was working in C Sharp, no developer was allowed to use a debugger on my team without my permission. And if I caught you using a debugger without my permission, I sent you home. Sent you home. I said, get the heck out of here. I don't want to see you. I don't care where you go. Leave. Why did I do that? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have a mental model to code, and the logs are not working for you during development, how the heck are they going to work for you when you have a production problem? Are you going to run and attach your debugger to that particular production environment? No. You've got to validate that these logs are working for you day in and day out. And when they fail, you have a mental model issue. This is not a Band-Aid now. You've got probably some code restructuring to do. You don't want to write legacy code? These are things that are going to allow you to do it. I'm not saying debuggers are evil. They're not. They're a tool. They serve a purpose. But when, they be, when you become dependent on a debugger, you've lost control of your code base. And honestly, you're not fixing bugs as fast as you could. You're not writing this software to be as, as, as good as it can be. I want us to get into these mindsets. Now, I love asking people, is performance your highest priority? And if you're going to tell me it is, you're in the wrong room. You got to, should be going to a Rust conference, right? Or some assembly language. From a Go perspective, and I will always say performance is important. It absolutely is. But it cannot be our highest priority. We've got to make sure that the software we're writing is fast enough. I need us all to get into this mindset. It's not about whether Go is faster than this or that. No, 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 no. Is it fast enough? And if it's fast enough, then we're good. And so. We're going to get into these ideas okay, of correctness versus performance. This is really important to me. It usually takes me a couple days to truly teach what I mean by correctness over performance. We're going to have some time. We'll talk about it. But any time you write a piece of code and I ask you, why did you write that code? And you say, oh, Bill, because it's going to perform faster. We're going to have a problem. We're going, to, we're going to take a walk. Everybody loves them in the classroom when I say take a walk. We're going to take a walk because if you tell me right now that that code that you just wrote is going to be faster that way and you don't have a benchmark or a profile, guess what? You're guessing. Or you've written that code so many times in your career, you're solving the same problem over and over again. I mean, that's no fun either. So there's never a reason to guess when we're writing code. Go's tooling is so powerful that it tells us what we need to focus on as it relates to performance. 
So I want us to focus on correctness. I want to focus on integrity, readability, simplicity. And then ask ourselves, once we have a working program, because if you don't have a working program, then nothing matters at all. Once we have a working program, now we can say, is it fast enough? And it's fast enough, how brilliant is this? Think about this. You just wrote a piece of code that can't be any simpler, and it's fast enough. You didn't have to be clever. This is our Go philosophy. This is the philosophy I need to take, I need you to take with you throughout the rest of the day and when you leave. All right? So quotes around this, quotes around this. All right, Wes Dyer, make it correct, make it clear, make it concise, and then make it fast. And you do it in that order. I cannot stress enough that this language, this ecosystem between tracing and profiling and a bunch of other tooling means that you do not have to guess about performance. You don't have to worry about it when we're writing code. Look, JBD, Google, Jana. Good engineering is less about finding the perfect solution and more about understanding the trade-offs. Didn't I already tell you before? Engineering is about what? The costs that you're taking for the decisions that you're making. And there she is again saying that. Jason Moriani works over at Datadog. Choosing the right limitation for a certain problem domain is much often more powerful than anything else. Are you getting the message here? Are you getting the message here? Correctness of the implementation is the most important concern. But what is he saying? He's saying it requires thinking of invariance. There's our trade-offs. There's our cost. It requires testing. Think about this for a second. If you're writing more code than you need, that means you've got to write more tests than you need. And the reality is you're probably going to be test incomplete. We're wasting effort at all levels. And code reviews. Code reviews. I want you to think about this for a second. Code reviews. Code reviews requires what? Requires our ability to read code. Do you realize that we're one of the fewest industries, maybe the only industry that I can think of, where we ask people to learn how to write before we teach them how to read? How ridiculous is that? We ask people to learn how to write before we teach them how to read. Yet everything that I've been talking to you about, mental models, costs, all that comes from our ability to read code to understand that code. Everything comes from our engineering. Our best engineering practices come from reading, and we're asking everybody to jump into writing. If you walk into one of my classes, we don't do a single exercise. Why? Because I got two or three days with you, and the most important thing I can do is teach you how to read code and go. And read that code, be able to visualize it, understand how it's going to perform on that machine, understand the costs. So anytime we look at a piece of code, I'm going to ask you, Okay, that's great. What is the cost we're taking here? What is the cost we're taking there? Now you're engineering. Now, now we're validating that the solutions we're building aren't going to be legacy. All right? Jason Fried, this one is absolutely important. Problems can usually be solved with simple, mundane solutions. It means there's no glamorous work. You don't get to show off your amazing skills. You just build something and get the job done, and then you move on. And you might not get those oohs and ahs, but you move on. When people ask me what I do, I tell them, I write air conditioners. And they're like, what? I go, yeah, I write air conditioners. I go, you've been in this room for how long? An hour? Yeah. Are you being comfortable for the last hour? Have you thought about at all? Have you thought about the system that's keeping the temperature in this room comfortable? No. What happens if that starts to break down? Are you going to start thinking about it? Yeah, you are. In fact, it's going to be the only thing on your mind. We need to get into this mindset that we write air conditioners. Nobody should know who we are. You want people to know who you are? Become a front-end dev. That's where that is. But I promise you, after two weeks of putting a button and all these things all over the screen and, 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 and working hard to do that, the first thing out of somebody's mouth is going to be, I don't like where that is. And you're just going to like, Ugh. yeah, that's why I'm not a front-end dev. That's why I'm on this stage. you got to get into this mindset that you build air conditioners. If anybody knows your name, that means you have failed. You failed. Not good. Not good. Get that going. So, and this also brings up to a point. I want to stop putting people on a pedestal who walk up on stage and say, I'm going to show you how to shave two milliseconds off this algorithm. No, 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 no. Let's stop 
looking at people who know how to make things run faster, somehow be smarter and better than anybody else. We've got to put people on a pedestal that say, I just wrote this piece of code and everybody in this room, and I don't care how many years you've been writing software, can understand it. Those are the people that we put on a pedestal. Those are the people we want to work with. Those are the people that are giving us code bases that won't be legacy. That's what we want. Now, in order to achieve these things, all right, there's a few things that we have to be able to do as developers. I love this idea. What is the difference between a senior and a junior developer? Think about these things. I'm asking you questions. What are your answers to this? I'm giving you quotes from other people. I don't have an original thought in my head. I don't. I love studying history. I love studying these people who are out there who are real thought leaders. What are they saying? There's a main consensus here over 40 years. But look, this one is really important. What is the difference between a junior and a senior developer? It's not time. It is not time. It's one, people who take personal responsibility for the software they write. Are you taking personal responsibility for the software you write? It's the difference between somebody being able to say, I don't know, and asking that dumb question. On Twitter today, I asked, not a technical question, but I finally said, what does IC mean? I've seen tweets for two weeks about IC versus managers. I have no idea what IC is. Right? I'm supposed to know, I guess. But look, I don't know. I'm willing to say it. I have no clue. We've got to be able to be willing to be vulnerable. Because when you're not willing to be vulnerable, then you're not willing to learn. You're not willing to step up and say, I need help. I have a 20-minute rule in my office, a 20-minute rule. If you're stuck for 20 minutes and you don't ask for help, I kick you out of the office. I've done it. I've sat behind a developer far away and watched them for 40 minutes struggle and not move forward. And I walk over to them, I tap on the shoulder, I say, get your stuff and get out. Go to the beach. I don't care where you go, get out of my sight. Bill, why? Because you spent 40 minutes and you've been stuck here and you haven't asked for help once. Get out. They pack up their stuff, they leave, they try to come back in five minutes because you know what happens in five minutes, right? They cleared their head and now they think they have a solution. And they walk back in, you know what I say to them? Get out, and if I swear, if I see a git, a git commit, we're in deep trouble. Go home, clear your head, and I don't want to see you. This is really important stuff. And I don't care how many years I've been writing software for well over 25 years. It is impossible for us to know everything. It is impossible. There is too much going on. Way too much. All right. Now, president of Pixar, look, mistakes are going to happen. But guess what? Without mistakes, you're not learning. So let's not be afraid of making mistakes. I had in an office one time that I worked, we had called the boot. We had the boot. It was this big sneaker. It was about, well, maybe about this big. Like something Shaq O'Neal, you know, basketball player. I saw him one time. I came up to his waist. I mean, that's how big that guy is. And what we did with the boot was the following. If you caused a production problem or you caused a problem that caused the development team to shut down, you got the boot. You're you had to show that boot on your desk full front. We wrote up what you did and we put it in. We did that because the idea was when you make a mistake, you own it, you take responsibility, you fix it. And you own that boot until the next mistake. That was it. And I told every new employee, if I don't see this boot on your desk in the next 12 months, you're not going to be working here. Because if you don't have the boot, you're not working. You're not taking some challenges. You're not taking some risks. I don't want you here. I want you making mistakes because then we're moving forward. I want you to take responsibility for those mistakes. There were days where I just got up off my desk, walked over to whoever had the boot, picked it up, and started walking. and everybody would be like, oh, what did you do? I said, I'll tell you once I fix it in about an hour. <laughs> I've made some really bad mistakes. It's okay. We all do. Nobody's perfect. So if we really, really want to make sure that we're not writing legacy software, if we really want to make sure that we are optimizing for correctness, minimizing, there are things that we have to take as a priority every single day when we are writing code. Number one is integrity. Integrity must be your number one priority. It is for Go. It is for Go. And like I told you already about cost, you know what the cost of integrity is? It is performance. 
You're going to have to take a little bit of performance in order to get integrity. But wouldn't you rather have a piece of software that runs day in and day out and doesn't have to wake you up at 3 in the morning than something that's crashing all the time just because it's faster? Look, integrity is about taking reliability very, very seriously. In fact, I want to ask you a question. Everybody in this room has a phone. Every single person has, this, has a phone in every country. I, you all have them. So let me ask you a question. Every single phone in India for the next hour stops working. Everybody's phone for the next hour stops working. How many people are going to die? It's a serious question. I can tell you this. The answer is not zero. The software you're writing, if you're using Go and infrastructure code, has people's lives at risk. I don't care what the industry is. You might say, Bill, I'm not in healthcare. Well, if you're in finance and I wake up in the morning and I don't have any money and I'm already stressed out, what am I going to do? Oh, Bill, I'm in gaming. Well, I wake up in the morning and I lost all my money and I had to pay. Oh, trust me. I don't care what the industry is. People's lives are at risk. And we have to take this. In fact, I'm gonna, I can at least, I think, in the United States, I predict in the next 15 years, every software developer is going to have to be licensed. Think about this. We have people's lives at risk every single day, and we are not licensed to do our job. Is there another profession that has people's lives at risk and they're not light? Think about it. You think that's going to last? This is the wild, wild rest, west right now. It really is. This is going to happen. Back, and by the way, in the 90s, in the early 90s, I worked for a hospice company. Hospice is where you have six months or less to live. I wrote a piece of software that failed and somebody died over the weekend. I come in on a Monday and I'm told this person died because they didn't get something they were supposed to, they were supposed to get. It was a system that sent faxes at the time to different pharmacies. Somebody died. It's my software. So I've lived it. I've been there. I've been there. This is going to change. So we've got to take integrity seriously. If you don't, you're not working for me. I could tell you that right now. It's one of the very first things I want to be able to get a sense of. Do you take personal responsibility? Do you take integrity seriously? Now, integrity means two things. It means two things. It's a micro level and it's a macro level. First, at a micro level, I want you to think about it. Every line of code you write, every single line of code you write, basically does three things. It allocates some memory, it reads that memory, and it writes that memory. That is all you're doing all day. You want to take it to another level? You're reading and writing numbers. Lights are on, phones are working, video. Think about it. You're reading and writing numbers all day long, and all this crazy stuff happens. So at a micro level, what we mean by integrity is every read and every write is accurate, consistent, and efficient. And when it's not, you have an integrity issue, and you're responsible to shut that software down. We all have stories. A piece of software that lost integrity, kept running, and caused havoc, caused issues. We've all been there. We all have a story. But there's a macro level to integrity, too. And I want you to think about this. Every problem you solve, every single problem you've ever solved with a line of code is a data transformation problem. You are all data scientists. You really are. I need everybody to get into their head that they are data scientists. You work with data. And at the heart of it, you perform data transformations. Every function, every program is a data transformation. So uh, integrity at a macro level means that every data transformation is accurate, consistent, and efficient. And when it isn't, you've got an integrity issue. This is not a joke. I laugh at Daniel Whitenack all the time because he's our, like one of our leading Go data scientists. I go, Daniel, man, you guys are a trip. You guys decided to come up with these fun names like machine learning and AI. Come on, dude, we've been doing that there for 40 years. You guys just slapped a label on it. Now, let's get honest, right? They formalized it. We got data modeling, we got cool algorithms, we got TensorFlow. They have formalized it. But I never want anybody in this room to not understand that they are a data scientist. Rule number one, if you do not understand the data you are working with, you do not understand the problem you are trying to solve. And if you don't know the problem you're trying to solve, how the heck can you write code at any level of accuracy, consistency, and efficiency to do it? What is the data you're working with? What is that input? What is that output? What is the bigger problem? And what happens when that data is changing? Everything you do is data driven. And Go is really about data driven. Go doesn't have the keyword class. Methods in Go are not declared inside of a struct. They're separated separating data from behavior. It's a big, big, big deal. 
So I want you to start thinking about data-oriented design. I want you to start thinking about the data you're working with. If you do not understand the data, you do not understand the problem. Now, integrity also requires a few things from us. You got to write less code. You just do. There were studies done where 15 to 50 bugs per average developer for every 1,000 lines of code, which basically tells you this, and put yourself in this category. For every 20 lines of code you write, you've added a bug to your software. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Every 20, lines of code is critical. Lines of code tell you what your team size should be. Lines of code tell you how many bugs you have. So you want to reduce bugs. You want to maintain higher levels of mental models. You got to do what? Write less code. This is serious stuff. And error handling. I, I, I always cry a little bit when people are complaining about error handling and go. Errors are not an exception. They're part of the main code. It's the majority of what you should be focusing on. Here's the reality. A six-year-old can get a program working today. All they got to do is use Google. Engineering is not about writing a piece of software that works. It's about writing a piece of software that continues to run when things are going bad and can recover and not add more problems to the problem. That's engineering. That's what we need to do. Look, there was this study done with leading products, and one of them is Redis. And Redis is probably a product that more lives on the planet are, are, are on, right, than anything else. Redis, how many of us use Redis as like an in-memory data store? How many lives are dependent on Redis? And yet 92% of the critical errors in this study could have been avoided with better error handling. So I don't want us to think about Go as not having exceptions as a bad thing, no. What Go is saying is every line of code you run could change the state of the data you're working with. When that data is no longer accurate, consistent, or efficient, you've got an integrity issue, you have a responsibility to recover or shut down. That's what we're doing here. That's why we're checking every single step of the way because we care about integrity. And if you don't, like I said, you're not working with me. Now, after integrity, we've got readability. And readability to me comes in two pieces. There's two pieces of it. There's a subjective piece and there's, there's a measurable piece. Let's talk about the subjective piece. For the projects that you are on and for the teams that you work on, the average developer on your team should be able to comprehend every single line of code. So this is what I ask everybody. I want you to think about yourself right now. Put yourself in your head. And I want you to think about the team that you work with, most likely three or four other people. Think about yourself and think about your team. Visualize all of the faces of those people on your team. Now ask yourself, am I the average developer on my team? Do I consider myself the average? Do I comprehend every single line of code for the projects I'm working on? Now evaluate every other person on your team. Who is average, who is less, and who is more? Are those people who are less, are they working hard to come up to speed so they can comprehend that code? Those people who are more, are they not being clever? Are they respecting our team and writing code that everybody can comprehend? Is that happening? Because if it's not, we've got problems. And if you're going to hire somebody and you don't know if they're average, less, or below, above or below, you're in trouble, right? If you hire somebody and they're less than average and you're not ready to bring them up to speed, you're going to have conflicts. What I think is worse is you hire somebody that's above average and they're not willing to write code that's less clever. That's even worse. You wonder why these teams are so hard to deal with and manage. I want you to start truly evaluating who you are and who your teammates are. Look, you put me on a crypto team, dude, I am way below average. I've got a ton of work to come up. They cannot dummy down that code for me. You put me on a team building business layer APIs, I've got to not be so clever. That's where a lot of my experience is. You've got to understand who that average developer is, and you've got to put those teams together accordingly. This is really important. But the measurable piece for me is this. You cannot have code that hides cost. And when you do, you cannot maintain a mental model of the code. This is so important. So generalized abstraction. Layers of abstraction that are generalized are not going to help you in terms, they're going to hide cost at the end of the day. 
One of the most beautiful things about Go and, and the interfaces and how these things work is they allow you to do a thin layer of decoupling that is not generic, but precise. Precise is everything. And so if we care about readability, we need to care about these two things. Understanding that average developer on a team and, and do we have the level of comprehension and not hiding cost. In one of my classes, I spend two days showing you not hiding cost. If we had a little more time, I'd give you an example of it. So we want to focus on that. Now the last thing here. In fact, actually, I love this quote from, from Nate Finch. Really do love this quote. It was in a blog post he wrote last year. This is a cardinal sin amongst programmers. If code looks like it's doing one thing and actually doing something else, someone down the road will read that code and misunderstand it, and it's going to cause bugs, alter situations. Whew. This is real stuff. Obviously, Nate ran into this, didn't he? Didn't he? Okay. The last thing is simplicity. We always talk about write code that's readable and simple. But for me, the funny thing about writing code that's readable and simple is simplicity is fighting with readability. Readability is about not hiding cost. Simplicity is about hiding complexity. And it's third because of this. You're not allowed to make something simple if we lose our ability to read it. You're not. Readability has to come above simplicity. And the problem is that simplicity is not something you can do day one. It is something that you have to refactor into, which leads me to a very large conversation. I had somebody tell me one time, oh, Bill, if you're refactoring code as much as you do, oh, you're making mistakes. What? Slow down. I refactor code because I'm constantly learning. Refactoring is about learning and improving. You can't refactor everything all the time. But if you, if you did a pair programming session with me for a day, you would realize that I probably write about 30% new code in a day and 70% of my time is spent refactoring. Refactoring to me is part of the development life cycle. I write a piece of code, I get it to work. Once I get it to work, I do a readability review on that code immediately. Readability review. How are my variable names? How is my code structure? How is everything laid out? Can I find everything? Does this make sense? I'll spend time cleaning it up. Then I move on and I get the next thing working. And then what do I do? Readability review. I've just thrown more code. Maybe things have to be put somewhere else. Maybe things have to be reorganized. Get something working. Readability review. All day long. This is it. You want to write less bugs. You don't want to write legacy code out of the box. You got to be improving. If you can be refactoring code every day, that means that this product isn't going to be legacy, is it? It's not. And that refactoring means that you've got good test coverage. It means you have the ability to make those changes and feel confident that if you did break something, you're going to identify it. But it's not something you can do later. It's something you've got to be doing every single day now. And then, what well, we can say there are two types of software projects. Those that fail and those that run in production for a very, very long time. I need you, I really do need you to get these ideas of integrity, readability, and simplicity in your head. I want it to become part of your daily life as a developer. I want you to ask yourself every single day, what is the legacy I'm leaving behind? Am I taking personal responsibility for the software that I am writing? Am I really trying to improve the world? Or am I just hacking my way through it for a paycheck? It's sad if that's what the case is. Go has done something amazing. It has given you a language and a tool set that allows you to be successful with these ideas. These are 40 years of, of understanding and knowledge that we've gotten to. The language is engineered with all of this in mind. This language gives me chills because of the way it's engineered. So I want you to take full advantage of this opportunity to begin to write less code, to begin to be engineers again, to understand cost. Go's model is a real machine. You get to have a real effect on the machine. You get to understand reasonably well how your code is going to run if you give yourself the opportunity to do that. And this is what I'm trying to do every single week in my training. 
I'm trying to make sure that the engineers we have today and the engineers coming tomorrow understand all of these things, take them to heart, and leverage Go's ability to give you this. And then we're going to have an amazing world of software. We're never going to have to worry again about what is the legacy we're leaving behind. Thank you.